The war between Israel and Hamas has caused an eruption of anger and grief in many corners of the world. The United States stands with Israel. Inside government, there is some disagreement about the approach. U.S. provided arms should not be used to massacre civilians. The recent conflict in Palestine has sparked a wave of criticism and dissent within the U.S. government as some officials question the Biden administration's unwavering support for Israel's military actions. A lot of people think the U.S. isn't being fair in its one-sided support for Israel, and now some top officials are beginning to speak up. Not just that, a particular U.S. official just resigned and gave some brutally honest interviews, and from the looks of it, many more officials will follow. Join us as we discuss how U.S. officials are resigning and now revealing the truth about Israel's war. The conflict between Israel and Palestine, which began on May 10, 2023, has resulted in hundreds of casualties and widespread destruction in the Gaza Strip, as well as rocket attacks on Israeli cities and towns. The Biden administration has repeatedly affirmed its commitment to Israel's security and right to self-defense, while also calling for a de-escalation and a ceasefire. However, some U.S. officials and lawmakers have expressed concern over the disproportionate use of force by Israel and the humanitarian crisis crisis in Gaza, as well as the lack of progress in resolving the underlying issues of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The situation led to a State Department official, Josh Paul, who worked on arms transfers to foreign powers, to resign Wednesday over the Biden administration's handling of the conflict in Israel and Gaza, declaring he could not support further U.S. military assistance to Israel and calling the administration's response an impulsive reaction based on intellectual bankruptcy. Josh Paul was director of Congressional and public affairs at the State Department's Bureau of Political Military Affairs, which handles arms transfers. His departure marks a rare measure of internal discomfort over the administration's robust support for Israel, the United States' closest ally in the Middle East. More broadly, it was an unusually public show of dissent within President Biden's foreign policy apparatus, which has worked to prevent such expressions of frustration from spilling over into view. Paul has served for more than 11 years in his role, which involved coordinating relations with Congress and public messaging for a crucial office that handles military aid. He stated that he could not tolerate staying in a job that he believed was facilitating the killing of Palestinian civilians. In a viral letter, he wrote that one-sided U.S. support for Israel is short-sighted, destructive, and contradictory. During an interview, he was asked if he tried to raise specific concerns with specific people before he quit his job as a U.S. official who was involved in the arms sales to Israel. He said he wrote to a number of officials within the department within two days of Hamas's atrocity when the militant group fired rockets at civilian areas in Israel, recognizing what was probably going to come down the pike and knowing how we've seen previous conflicts like this play out in Gaza, where Israel retaliated with airstrikes that caused massive casualties and destruction. He basically asked them to pause and think before they rushed arms into this conflict, before they added fuel to this fire that was already raging. He asked if there were no other things the U.S. could be doing, such as mediating a ceasefire, providing humanitarian aid, or supporting a diplomatic solution. He said, and let's look at our track record and wonder how it led us to this point. I was met offline with some agreement, but online, as it were, with a stony silence and continued directives to just keep moving arms as quickly as possible. He said he felt morally conflicted and decided to resign in protest. He also mentioned how he attempted to voice his objections to his bosses, citing the potential violations of human rights and international law by Israel only to be met with indifference and silence from the higher-ups. He said that Israel is the only exception to the U.S. arms sales policy that considers the humanitarian impact of the weapons and that the U.S. turns a blind eye to the suffering of the Palestinians. Paul exposes the hidden directives within the Biden administration that prevents any dissent or criticism of the deal. The policy is not up for debate because it's dictated by the highest authority. When asked if he could give a sense of what he thinks the real number of military aid sent to Israel Israel every year by the U.S. might actually be, considering that there are other forms of assistance that are not publicly disclosed. He said, We are talking about $3.3 billion a year in foreign military financing, which is the State Department's main method for providing military assistance and granting military assistance overseas. This is part of a 10-year memorandum of understanding signed in 2016 that guarantees Israel $38 billion in military aid over a decade. Incidentally, the State Department's total 
budget for foreign military financing typically hovers around $6 billion. So the U.S. is basically giving more than half of its military assistance globally to Israel, which is already one of the most advanced and powerful militaries in the region. The Department of Defense also gives $500 million, which it provides to Israel for cooperative development of missile defense programs such as the Iron Dome, David Sling, and Aero Systems. These programs are designed to intercept and destroy incoming rockets and missiles from various threats. In addition to these forms of aid, there are also other ways that the U.S. supports Israel militarily, such as loan guarantees, joint military exercises, intelligence sharing, and access to surplus weapons and ammunition. These are not always reported or accounted for in the official figures, so the actual amount of military aid that Israel receives from the U.S. could be much higher than what is publicly known. When asked what he thinks all the money is spent on, he suggested that Israel spends most of that money on major long-term defense articles such as fighter jets, tanks, helicopters, and missiles. He said that Israel has received over 350 F-16s, the largest fleet outside the U.S., and is also the first foreign country to receive the F-35, the most advanced stealth fighter in the world. Unlike almost every other country in the world, Israel is also permitted to spend up to 20% of its foreign refinance on what we call offshore procurement, which means that it can spend it directly in Israel buying weapons and equipment from its own manufacturers. The rest of foreign refinancing has to be spent in the U.S., supporting U.S. jobs with the U.S. companies. But Israel gets to spend some of its money domestically, and over the decades, that's actually greatly enabled the expansion of Israel's own domestic defense industry, which is now a top 10 exporter of defense arms and often competes with the U.S. in the global market. So it's the U.S his own funding that has enabled competition in this respect, creating a situation where the U.S. is essentially subsidizing its own rival. This is detrimental not only to U.S. interests, but also to the prospects of peace and stability in the Middle East. Unlike any other country in the world, Israel does not have to undergo a rigorous vetting process before receiving U.S. weapons and funds, which is required by the Leahy Law. The Leahy Law prohibits the U.S. from providing military assistance to foreign security forces that commit gross violations of human human rights, such as extrajudicial killings, torture, or enforced disappearances. However, in the case of Israel, the U.S. gives Israel aid first and then monitors if there are any reports of human rights abuses by Israel, such as targeting civilians, demolishing homes, detaining children, or restricting movement. If such reports emerge, the State Department initiates a policy process that involves consulting with Israel on its side of the story and then theoretically decides if Israel has committed a gross violation of human rights, which which would trigger the suspension or termination of the aid. However, this process, known as the Israeli Leahy vetting process, has never resulted in a finding that Israel has violated human rights despite the overwhelming evidence of its atrocities against the Palestinians documented by various human rights organizations, UN agencies, and media outlets. This means that Israel continues to receive U.S. military assistance regardless of its actions and their consequences for the Palestinian people. Paul said, I think that is obviously problematic when one looks at not necessarily even just Gaza, but the West Bank, where there are frequent reports of extrajudicial killings and other abuses by Israeli security forces. Paul said that the massive U.S. military aid for Israel was effectively a license for the country to wage war on Gaza without regard for the civilian casualties. He said that the U.S. aid, which amounts to billions of dollars every year, enables Israel to acquire advanced weapons and technology that give it a decisive edge over its adversaries. He also said that the U.S. aid shields Israel from any international accountability or pressure to end its occupation and oppression of the Palestinians. The Israeli government has announced that it intends to wipe out Hamas and has ordered the residents of Gaza City and northern Gaza to flee southward, a demand that U.N. observers have warned will trigger a humanitarian catastrophe. They have said that the residents have nowhere to go as the entire Gaza Strip is under siege by Israel and Egypt and that Israeli airstrikes have targeted civilian infrastructure such as roads, bridges, power plants, water facilities, and hospitals. They have also said that the Israeli attacks have killed hundreds of civilians, including many children, and injured thousands more. The State Department refuses to comment on Paul's resignation, invoking its policy on not discussing personnel matters. However, sources within the department have said that Paul's views were not shared by the majority of his colleagues who supported the U.S. policy of backing Israel unconditionally. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has been traveling across the Middle East in an effort to rally regional support for Israel's right to 
self-defense and prevent a regional conflict, but also to urge Israel to heed humanitarian considerations in Gaza. He has met with leaders of Israel, Egypt, Jordan, and Qatar, and has announced that the U.S. will provide $75 million in humanitarian aid to Gaza, as well as $5.5 million to rebuild a U.N. school that was damaged by Israeli fire. He has also reaffirmed the U.S. commitment to the two-state solution, which envisions a separate and independent Palestinian state alongside Israel, but has not offered any concrete steps to revive the stalled peace process. Paul said that he had encountered various challenges while working on military assistance within the State Department. He mentioned that in the past, he could usually find ways to steer things in the right direction, such as ensuring that the U.S. aid was used for legitimate purposes and that the recipients respected human rights and international law. However, this time was different and it was the primary reason for his resignation. He said that he felt morally conflicted and disillusioned by the U.S. policy of backing Israel unconditionally, regardless of its actions and their consequences for the Palestinians. While the State Department's Bureau of Political Military Affairs also played a significant role in arms transfers to Ukraine after Russia's invasion last year, Paul's academic background and career have a strong connection to Israel and the Palestinian territories. He wrote his master's thesis on Israeli counterterrorism and civil rights at Georgetown University, where he analyzed the impact of Israel's security measures on the rights and freedoms of its citizens and the Palestinians. He also worked on security sector governance with the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah and the West Bank as part of the U.S. program that aimed to reform and professionalize the Palestinian security forces and enhance their cooperation with Israel. In his resignation letter, he emphasized his deep personal ties to both sides of the conflict, saying that he had many friends and colleagues in Israel and Palestine and that he cared deeply about their safety and well-being. Since he publicly announced his resignation on LinkedIn with a two-page statement, he has received substantial support from his colleagues at the State Department who praised his courage and integrity. He has also received messages of gratitude and solidarity from many Palestinians and Israelis who appreciated his stance and his efforts to promote peace and justice. What do you think about this? Let us know in the comments section below.